Hi guys, Aaron Sansoni here, and thanks for joining me. It's a bit of a special day. I'm actually interviewing the CEO of Swiss, Radik Sali, who is a massively accomplished businessman himself. And uh, the company Swiss has gone leaps and bounds over its 50 years um, that it's been operating, and uh, especially since Radik took the helm about four or five years ago now. Uh, so we're going to be talking today a little bit about the success that Swiss has had, and a little bit about uh, uh, Radik's background, and then to see some things that we can work on together that maybe might be able to help you within your business, whether it's a startup or whether it's a current business, a few things that might spark some interest for you to really move the business to the next level. So the man I'm about to speak to, the man that we're about to speak to here is Radik Sali, and he has had some huge nominations last year, GQ Businessman of the Year in 2012, uh, which he tells me makes him you know, maybe 10% better looking. Um, and uh, also he uh, was the runner-up uh, CEO of the Australian CEO magazine last year and the health and pharmaceutical executive of the year in 2012. Now, did I miss anything at all? Uh, BRW. Uh, and, B and BRW Award as well. Anything yeah. else? Anything else? <laughs> Best private business for over 100 Best million. Best private business for right. over $100 million. Center. So this guy knows his stuff and uh, what an incredible man that we're we'll able to. So thank you firstly. Thanks for being a part of uh, being a part of this series and what we've been talking about. So I mean, let's start a little bit with, before we get to the massive things that you've been you know, working on individually within the company, I'd love to start off with a little bit about the company and one of the reasons that um, I looked heavily into Swiss and wanted us to speak is because I love the brand. I actually really do enjoy the brand that you have and uh, one of the things that I look at in terms of uh, as you know a brand externally to what we talk to customers about about what our brand is is if that is actually reflected internally within the company as well and do you know do we start working within our team to then affect the brand on the outside and they're the kind of things that I know within my companies and what I teach is really important in terms of marketing strategies as well so I wanted to find out a bit about yourself and about uh, the company I know that it started back in the the 60s mm -hmm. and uh, grew from there and you've, you joined the company, I believe, in an operations role, beginning with operations manager, and then moved into the CEO role. So you've had massive growth in the time that you've been here. I think it's about a thousand percent growth mm -hmm. over the time you've been here. And was it your first year you did 357 odd percent growth uh, in sales, yeah, uh, you know, in revenue, yep. which is fantastic. So maybe tell me a little bit about what did you do? I suppose everyone would be saying is, you know, what happened? What did you do when you joined the company? And when you first took on that CEO role, what is it that you saw that you knew you had to do, and then you know what sort of proceeded from there. Mm. Look, first of all, thanks for, for having me on the, on the show today. Okay. It's a real privilege to talk about our story of Swiss. Um, I think that the number one thing for us has been culture, and mm. culture makes everything else a whole lot easier. Yeah, uh, I was in a privileged position where uh, uh, I'd come from a background of, of health. My, my father's a professor of Great. surgery. Yeah. My mother's a medical scientist. Uh, so. Uh, coming from uh, Village Roadshow, which, yeah. which was entertainment, yeah. and we had new movies every week, uh, along with the balance of having a father who's a lecturer yeah. and, and lectured to me a lot on ideas <laughs> of health and lifestyle. So, uh, so you're never going to be bound to be the CEO of McDonald's or anything? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a challenging gig for me to take up, um, but we could do a lot of good there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, 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 look, I think that it came naturally, yeah. the transition. Um, and a lot of people would, would look at that transition and say, well, how does that work? That's but right. The background helped. Uh, so, so moving into the role as an operations person was very helpful too. Uh, yeah. We had, interestingly, it was a bit of a different uh, introduction to a new business too. We are turning 15 million in revenue there. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll turn 300 million this year. Wow. Um, so so um, what, 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 what I, the different introduction was that we had strong values mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know, having come from a big organisation, Big organisations do struggle with culture. Yes. It's something that gets Completely agreed. and put up on a wall. That's right. And yeah. it's really hard for people to connect That's with. That's right. We had this clear vision of our four Ps, which is people, principles, and passion coming before profit. Absolutely. As ops manager, I didn't see a P&L for the first six to 12 months of my existence. Wow. So <laughs> that was an interesting context to yeah. come into a business and, and to learn intuitively what was right mm. about our business, to go out and listen to our customers. I spent a lot of time with our retailers, a lot of time on the road with our, our salespeople listening to, mm. to um, what worked for them and what didn't work for them. So that helped me form, a, a, I suppose, a base and foundation. Also got a really firm understanding of, about how every area of our business worked and mm. operated. So I really have a great appreciation for every arm of our business. 
and that, that puts you in a great position with a, a base and foundation where you know, you, you're walking into a culture that you know where they see people principles and passion coming before profit yeah um, and 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 you, you get a feel for culture being uh, a key parameter in causing success mm. what we needed to do as an organization was to create process um, and structure okay. to enable creativity and entrepreneurship to thrive and, yeah. and that can quickly get forgotten mm. uh, it, it's great to have wonderful ideas but you do need structure and process Absolutely. to enable ideas to to occur so by the time I took on the general management role and bought into our business mm -hmm. and, and then on to, to CEO I had a really great grasp of what what it took to run this business but then also how we could take ideas that had been given to me out in retail land um, and and do do that but also do that and more of that and and a whole lot of other things so we wouldn't just rest on one theme like mm. ricky ponding was our first ambassador mm. with cricket which at first we lost a couple million dollars mm. in, in profit and and we got a 10 15 percent increase mm. in sales but that wasn't enough it wasn't sustainable mm. off the base of our sales we had to go and recreate the model and, and, and involve our retailers so they're emotionally engaged and would purchase stock to underpin mm. uh, the risk profile mm -hmm. of, of advertising like that. Um, and, and one most organisations would look at, well, cricket, do cricket well, and, and that should be what you do each year. Yeah. But we have something going on every month of the yeah. year. And, and also so many different sports. All segments, all yeah. sports, all destination viewing. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we also do a lot of reality TV. Absolutely. Um, and that, that's more of a female genre. So, mm. so we like to be across all segments and we like to challenge ourselves mm. to do better and to do more of what works. Yeah. I think that that's one thing we forget is to practice what works that's and right. do more and more of yeah. that uh, rather than do one, do it one thing yeah. and, and do that extraordinarily well, which, you know, it, in some cases works well. Yeah but it, you, you can create more rapid growth by yeah. challenging yourself. Because I think if I, I look at it from the outside of your brand, it's glaringly obvious that you use celebrity endorsements to be a big part of what you do. And being around um, you know, a lot of athletes, I mean, you know, AFL, you know, Cricket Australia, the Olympics, um, and then going to the celebrity endorsements, I know obviously you had a big following with Alan coming out here as well, um, Nicole Kidman being part mm. of the, the program as well. Celebrity endorsement, the idea of that within the marketing realm was being around for a while, but why did you decide that that would be a big part about how that would fit into your marketing strategy? What made you decide, let's do that bigger and better than, you know, what most companies in Australia? Yeah, look, it, it, it works twofold. And I took that idea from a competitor. Yeah. They, they had Rob De Costello as the, yeah. the front person. Yeah. And, and all of the retailers were telling me how well that works. Yeah. I saw pictures of Rob De Costello in all of the, yeah. the retail uh, stores. So, yeah. so when, well, how can, how can we make this more relative and make it connect with the market? And so we went with a cricket star. And yeah. Our Australian captain at the time was Ricky Ponding and we knew he took our product and was a big fan of it. We were yeah. supplying the cricket side. And, and, and cricket's it's like the, the captain of our side is considered as important as the, the Prime Minister. Absolutely. Rightly or wrongly, oh, yeah. but that's the case in Australia. <laughs> if they're winning. Exactly, correct. <laughs> if they're not, so, they're they, Exactly. And they make big news either way. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so, um, so we, we felt that that was a way of stepping it up yes. and, and bringing on a personality that was at their best and, mm. and, and performing. And there's a lot of risk involved because yes. when they're not at, Absolutely. at their best, you, Absolutely. it falls the other way. And, and that's, that's a fact of life. We're mm. all human. So, so we, we, we saw that as a, as a real opportunity to bring authentic characters to uh, the Australian public. Mm. And, and it started with Ricky because he's a user. And we make sure that all of our, our ambassadors are, are health and lifestyle fans and, and yes. love uh, supplements. And that's they, right. they've noticed and feel the difference. And, mm. and that's the difference when you've got an ambassador endorsing your product. It's, it's actually authentic. It's not a, an actor. Um, that traditionally happens in a 30 second advert. Yeah. They're acting out a situation yeah. that's for a company. This is someone putting their name to a brand and, and, and saying that this is truly making a difference yeah. to my life. And, and, you know, we really couldn't have afforded Ricky Ponding back in the day mm. unless he was passionate about, about what it. we do. Yeah. And Ricky Ponding opened other doors for, for other ambassadors to come on board. To come in as well. close mates with Mark Webber. Why would Mark Webber get behind a small vitamin company in Australia yeah. when he's being paid $9 million a year by Red Bull? Yeah, so, so he does, you know, yeah. he obviously he heard great things and mm -hmm. relationships make a huge difference. So, so momentum happens as a result of that and you've got to 
drive that momentum. And that's why I point out that fact of when you're doing one thing well, you know, don't rest on your laurels. Do more and more of what you do well mm. and, and create momentum because windows only open up for short mm. periods of time and you can keep that window open uh, longer by doing more and more good, good yeah, things. In business. And the, the, I suppose the second biggest thing that stands out for me when you're marketing strategy is your social media mm. and your presence within social media. Um, it's one of the things that, you know, having now educated in over 38 countries, I'm still baffled by the lack of take up of a lot of businesses, business owners on the transition to it's 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 being where your customers are and mm. i think that's one of the most basic marketing principles is you if you want to advertise well you need to be where your where your customers are now so what i notice is like i'd go out with family and friends and you know we're having a conversation but there's another conversation happening online there's a facebook conversation happening there's a twitter conversation happening there's a little video that's going to go to youtube and then so being online and being a part of that conversation and interacting with your audience and giving more and, and um, being a part of their lives um, before they need you and while they need you, I think is, is, is important as a strategy. And that's one of the things that I found really congruent with what I teach to my business owners and what you're doing now. And I think that kind of ties into the reports that I've read about you as being a really marketing savvy CEO. And I've, I've, I've coached a lot of companies and I've met a lot of CEOs and one of the things I've really noticed the difference is between what you're doing and it's glaringly obvious that is it because do you think the, the, the way that you've been able to grow the company through celebrity endorsements, the right kind of marketing, having the you know social media presence, is that something that you believe that you've come on and said this is part of what we're driving? Um, you know, is it the team? Um, is it um, sort of outside influences? What's kind of driven your idea to go down that social media um, mm -hmm. um, street? I think that uh, you rightly point out that we have a personality as a brand and, and a, a personality of a brand comes in through many fashions, so traditional yeah. TV, um, but undeniably in, in this age of digital dominance, uh, social media is a huge tool in helping bring personality to your brand. Sure. And I think uh, I used Red Bull as a link to, to Mark, Mark Webber, but they've done an extraordinary job in the yeah. land of digital and, and bring to life content and owning content and, and delivering that through uh, social media mm. and, and, and their website as a portal. portal. Um, so, so we see that there's a big opportunity for health and wellness yeah. to do the same thing. We've invested over $2 million in the last 12 months uh, in developing uh, a plan that we've launched in the last uh, three months mm. around Alan and Alan created a significant amount of interest and, mm. and a huge drive on the social media so I think huge growth in our mm. Facebook likes, huge growth in, yeah. in our Twitter followers and people becoming more engaged with yes. our brand so yeah. it's undeniable. You have to follow this, follow trends and, and be a part of it. You can't mm. just ignore it and I hear so many people that are you know haven't grown up with these mechanisms yes. say how frustrated they are with Twitter or Facebook and yeah. don't want to get it. That's the worst worst thing you can do. You need to understand it. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to like it, but you need to know what's going on and you need yeah. to be in tune with it. Well, it's a really interesting point. You and I are old enough to remember when mobile phones went, went out or when I remember my mum had one. It was one of those big analogue ones that open up and she was in real estate at the time. Yeah. So that's the only way she could get the calls and, you know, the, the numbers. I remember, you know, when, um, you know, the computers weren't a big thing. And I suppose at, we're in that interesting generation where we remember the things that weren't there but I think for the you know for the older let's say the baby boomer generation, it's been such a transition to be almost around our age now, and then learning, and then the internet starts, and then you know mobiles are a big thing. Well, I mean, let's say for instance, if, if for instance right out there we have a business owner that is in that baby boomer generation that's really overwhelmed, really overwhelmed specifically with social media. What would be you know your you know your first one or two steps that you would recommend for them just to think about doing to get more engaged within social media? What would you kind of give them advice? I think the most important thing is to understand that as humans we don't like change. Yes. <laughs> and change is something. And as much as we you know we'll say, oh, I'm a change yes. agent, I'm ready for it. <laughs> We need to start framing the fact that change is a good thing yes. and we need to make sure that we're reinforcing that all yeah. along the way. And it's okay for things to be a little difficult when you first try them. So social media, I, 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 you know, when I first opened my Twitter account, I was unsure as to how to use it and what it meant and, and it comes through trial and error that yeah. you, you get appreciation for it. Yeah. Same with Facebook yeah. and all of those mechanisms. And it's the same for anyone at any age group. It's, it's okay not to be an expert straight away. That's it's right. okay to get things wrong. Yeah. Um, but you'll learn through, um, I suppose, a continual focus. 
Um, and But then there's other things, like, you know, I've got mentors of all different ages. I have a mentor of, that's 21, and he's got 70,000 Twitter followers um, <laughs> growing at a rate of knots. And I regularly catch up with him and right. talk to him about how Twitter works and so yeah. forth. So don't go with the traditional mould of mentorship. Get mentors of all, all shapes and sizes totally right. and, and talk to you about these things, and, and, and then you'll have permission to learn. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's a really big part of it. And you're right, it comes down to the being, being afraid to change. And I think that some people... Um, it's, uh, it, it, we're in a big change within the way that we market. I mean, business is not going to be done the way that it is before. One of the things that I always talk about is that it's my belief that we want more, we're willing to go online, and we want to pay less. Yeah. You know, that's, that's my belief in terms of the way that we've changed as a market, right? You know, I, I, you know sometimes, uh, you know, I'll walk into a store with my wife and, you know, we might walk into a Maya. She'll pick up a product, she'll scan it on, her e on eBay and she'll find it for 40% cheaper. Now, we don't need to buy it 40% cheaper, but it's just, it's almost like it now it's become a catalogue. You know, you yeah. can just, and that's, I think... One of the biggest, you know, not just that, but that whole change in becoming, I suppose, what I would say the global village, we're able to now get products overseas easier than we were before. We're now competing. I mean, you know, if we have other company, companies that come into Australia, they can set up their brand here, they can manufacture off, offshore, much less overheads, let's say, than what you guys have, and really trying to dominate that market. So there's so much more global competition, and we, I know you're doing a lot of global expansion, which I really want to talk about as well. Mm. I mean, I think that that's part of it. I think that, you know, but, but starting, I think people get overwhelmed and say, oh, you know, I have to have a Twitter account. I have to, you know, do Google, do Google AdWords. I have to have um, a, a website that's changed every, you know, sort of three or four months. And I think that that's where people get overwhelmed with their yeah. strategy as well. So that's fantastic to hear about. So in terms of branding, and I know one of the things I've loved that you said is that I completely agree with, is that a company, uh, as it grows and matures and gets a better brand, it becomes almost a person. Mm. And I think that if, you know, um, when I, I was able to share the stage with Sir Richard Branson, one of the things that I talked to, to Tim and, you know, and the people in the, in the event about were, if you were to describe Virgin, if it was a person, what would you, what would you say it was? You know, and that would be, you know, fun, um, uh, great customer service, bubbly personality, um, and um, obviously you can't relate prices to it. But we almost, put a, a, we almost put a personality into a brand. How would you describe Swiss as a person? Mm. Look, I, I think it is an extremely healthy person. <laughs> <laughs> Health and happiness is, is what we're about. Yeah, and, um, and it's state of mind that yeah. makes, makes the decisions about whether we're going to take control of our health yeah. or not. So we want to be fun, enthusiastic about health and happiness. Yes. And, and we want to be, I suppose, ubiquitous in the fact that we want to appeal to all markets mm -hmm. because health and wellness is something that's aspirational mm -hmm. and we want to be presented as an aspirational uh, personality that people yeah. want to connect with and be a part of yeah. whether you're older or younger that's something we all want to do um, yeah. so so I think that that's what we're always aiming to reinforce definitely and one of the things I noticed as well with your company I know you have your four P's and one of the first one being you know people you know you got your health and happiness day uh, once a month they yeah. get an extra day off which that's is great right. massages yeah. um, yoga PT yeah. Um, you know, lunch provided, you know, that organic shows lunch. organic lunch provided <laughs> <laughs> with all the vitamins. And Absolutely. I did take my Ultivite this morning as well. <laughs> I'm feeling passionate already. Um, so, and I actually switched to that, you know, I switched to, um, uh, you know, I switched that maybe, you know, a month or two ago. Um, I was the sort of person who just walked in and just got what was on the shelf, you know, and then, and just sort of went from there. And then as you get more educated, I think once you start something, you get yourself more educated about it. You start to look at, okay, well, will I test this and see if I feel better? And you know what? It is. You do feel better on Swiss, as you know, as they say with that as well. So, in terms of branding, and we were talking about um, a brand becoming a person almost, and we, and we talked about that externally. You have great policies inside, like I've just mentioned, within your company that really does um, uh, really does get that right culture that you need to be carried forward within your marketing. What would you say is with this? I'm presuming the success as you've already said, is a lot to do with your people. What percentage of that is recruited and what percentage of that is because of the policies that you have in place for your people? It's a challenging balance and fundamentally we always try, where possible, to make room for great people yeah. that we come in to counter with. And yeah. we feel great people will always make a role work. So we put the person before a job description. And um, so if we meet someone that's extraordinarily 
great seller or marketer, we bring them on board yeah. and, and we know that they'll pay for themselves. Yeah. So so that comes first is people and then your, your structures come, come second. Okay, yeah. that sounds good. So let's say if I'm a, you know, I'm a budding entrepreneur, I've got a great idea for a product and one of the things that I always teach them about is just to be honest with yourself about the things that you don't know, okay? Like when I first started off, I was incredibly good at selling, but really bad with my admin. So what happened was we had great sales, but we're spending like there's no tomorrow and not doing our accounting properly. So one of the failures that I had early on in business was because we didn't do our books properly. So one of the things that I teach people from experience as well is to look at what you're not good at and find the people that you know fill that gap. Now, as a budding entrepreneur that doesn't have you know, the money to you know, employ full-time salaries and things, what would you say is an idea where they can, they can meet people or just a way that they can start to get people to maybe work with them while they're trying to form their idea in their company um, that maybe they can't afford to necessarily employ them on a full-time salary? What sort of advice would you give them? Look, it does get easier as you become bigger yes. <laughs> and you do attract uh, yeah. people of great talent. Yeah. And we always point out the yin and the yang yeah. uh, with, with relationships in our business yeah. and we need to be uh, very aware of where we're strong and where we've got shortfalls. Mm. So you're absolutely right. So if you're starting alone, you need to really be aware and very self-aware of where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are yeah. and know that from day dot and, and think about every decision you're making in that context and you know have I yes I've got all these areas I'm very confident right uh, but where I'm not so confident maybe I need to get advice seek yeah. advice and and there's nothing wrong with uh, paying an accountant for some some uh, financial advice occasionally yes yeah. <laughs> so I contract in that would have been good early on for, for me in my first businesses as well, which is good as well. So, I mean, you know, part of, you know, um, you're a very passionate CEO, you know, you've got a great marketing head about you. Um, I love that you've got, you know, the peoples and the principles and the products and you, you think about those things before you look at your profits because we know that that begets profits, right? That's part of part of it as well. Um, what sort of, what other sort of advice would you give to people in terms of um, growing a brand, maybe on maybe a shoestring budget is, what, what would you give them in terms of, you know, because obviously maybe they can't afford to go get a celebrity or something like that, what can they do um, to grow a brand? Like let's say for instance, let, let's re reverse the question. Mm. Let's say you've got a brand new company. If you only had a thousand dollars to spend, mm. what would you spend it on in, 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 in marketing? What in marketing. would you spend it on? Well, uh, first of all, I'd look at what I'm doing yep. and ensure that whatever I am doing, I'm actually rewriting the rule book. Yep. The hardest thing uh, people find in competing with us in our mm. space is they don't understand what we're going to do yes. or, or uh, come up with next. Yeah. Um, so you, you need to make sure that when you're entering at something new and inspirational. So the great idea mm. is something that is a game changer yeah. um, before you even go great. spending your thousand dollars. Very good, very good advice. You've got a game changer idea, which is good as well. So I think that's fantastic. And I think you know for you guys moving forward, you've got some great expansion um, happening. Um, you know, in the US, tell us a little bit about the overseas, Europe, Asia. What, yeah. What's the? Tell us about the world dominance of, yeah. of Swiss coming up. Our, our pleasure to do. <laughs> because uh, things are going really well. We're yeah. in over 20,000 stores now in the USA. Yeah. Uh, we've only been on shelf for the last two months. Yeah. The sales numbers are very good, so we're happy with how it's progressing. It's also enabled us to excite our marketplace here in Australia with the likes of Alan and Nicole Kidman. Personalities we, we, couldn't, con we couldn't afford yes. to connect yeah. with our brand if we were just selling out of the Australian market. Yeah. And to have someone like Nicole Kidman who endorsed the likes of Chanel and Amiga uh, prior to our, our Australian brand as yeah. the first Australian endorsement. We're excited by that, and she's our only Oscar-winning actress. Which um, is good, and she's had eight, been nominated for eight, um, eight, eight others as well, Golden Globes as absolutely. well. Absolutely, she's, she's a superstar, yeah. and, and I'm sure we'll uh, continue to, to see great things from her. And Alan is, an, is another partner yeah, that took us many years to make happen, mm -hmm. and, and Nicole was a big part of helping yeah, us yeah. make that happen. Yeah. And this is that momentum I talk about that was the same with Ricky Ponning. Yeah. It opens up other doors and, and you've got to build on that momentum. So we're looking forward to stepping it up again with Alan now on board and, and who, who's next in the US, we'll see. Fantastic. And one of the things as well um, in terms of people coming to, like you're, you, you're, 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 you sell you know, 99% I presume of your products through your third parties, through your channel marketing partners. I know you do some direct sales online yeah. as well. You know, sometimes people find it difficult to, um, to be able to go out there and find a partner that they can go out there and you know sell into Coles or a big W or something like that. What what kind of advice would you give them if they're looking to try and pitch a product to somebody like yep. that? I think that the first thing you have is to have an extraordinarily good product. We know that we, we keep the most amount of people that try supplements and, yeah. and your story about your journey of 
taking a multivitamin and then uh, as you learned more, you've progressed to our brand is, is what we're about. Um, so we've got a premium product and a retailer, when they know they take us on, uh, they'll be able to keep their customers. So it becomes an easy story then to, uh, to um, I suppose, the transitions to exciting uh, the consumer to purchase our product and, and how we excite them is through great uh, personality in our brand and having all those people involved and, and that's the point of difference and you can you can see if retailers don't get it because if you if you show them what we've done and it's wow factor yeah it stands out and that's what we challenge ourselves to do that and they say well what's your point of difference in the market you know they're not really engaging with you um, but you know the amount of times we, we haven't heard that um, is, is exactly what's happening in the US and as well, exactly fantastic. why we got support here. Which is fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, for joining you. me today. I really appreciate it. Appreciate so there it. you go, guys. Radik Sali here, the CEO of Swiss, showing us how to really uh, progress in the 21st century and some of the amazing things that he's done for the company over the past uh, couple of years at the helm. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys will be going to do next as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.